Hi, I'm Nick Patry, producer on the What Fuels You podcast with Shauna Swirland. This week, we're doing something a little different. We're bringing you insights and takeaways from some of the guests Shauna has had on the show over the past five years. You'll hear Shauna introduce the guest and what their role was at the time of the recording, and then an excerpt from their full interviews. We hope the knowledge and experience of these leaders and entrepreneurs offer you some inspiration on your own journey through business and life, and we look forward to bringing you more full-length interviews in the weeks ahead. Feel free to reach out with any questions, thoughts, or guest recommendations to podcast at fueltalent.com. Thanks for listening. I'm here today with Jane Park, the CEO and founder of Julep. Jane is a wife, a mother, and a very successful entrepreneur who is passionate about empowering women. The thing that I always say to people is that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. I think that's the biggest thing for me. I used to think that everybody else had a rule book or that they were walking around comfortable in their own skin. And I was the only one who didn't understand the rules of the game. And uh, it was actually helpful in my experience at BCG and actually being in boardrooms with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and realizing they're just making it up too. Like these are people who are smart and capable, um, but it's not like they are, you know, completely comfortable in their own skin and yeah. that they're, they have the exact right way of doing things. We're all making it up as we go along. Today on the What Fuels You podcast, I have Matt Oppenheimer here with me. Matt is the co-founder and CEO of Remitly, the largest private digital remittance company in the U.S. Tell me how you ended up uh, working at Barclays and Kenya and London. I mean, how cool. Did you raise your hand and say, pick me? Or did that kind of happen organically? Yeah. So when I was looking at jobs post Harvard, I wanted to do a general management program. So a lot of folks that, like assume that Barclays was an investment banking role, but there's corporate banking, like providing banking services to your average business, right? Small business. And then there's retail banking, which is having like a Barclays or, you know, Bank of America um, in the U.S. context bank account. I was in their corporate and retail banking. Mm. And when I was looking at jobs, I looked at a variety of general management roles. But what I was drawn to at Barclays was the fact that it was international, which has also been a kind of theme throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And I got really good advice from the now dean. He was one of my professors, but now dean of um, HBS. Called, his name is Nitin Noria. And he was basically like, okay, go you, go do Barclays. Like, but London is like international. I, I like had done real some, international. Yeah, I had done some volunteer work in Africa. And so I just his, – this conversation stuck with me because after I had been in London for a bit, I took the definite road less traveled within the Barclays. Like you don't – if you're trying to work your way up in the Barclays like, you know, mothership, you don't go to Nairobi, Kenya <laughs> and run digital channels for them. It's just far afield. But Nitin's uh, advice stuck with me, and I went there and had a great experience in Kenya, and then that's obviously where the idea for Remitly came from. Yeah, and so tell me about that. Like, Do you remember the moment when you thought of the idea, and who did you first kind of run it past? The idea was more organic in the sense that – like, and it's actually much broader than – Kenya. The other thing is, as a kid, growing up in Boise, my, it was really important to my parents that we traveled internationally. And so I've been to close to 100 countries, and we went to places as a young, young kid when I was like six or seven years old to a lot of developing countries. And I saw, as a six-year-old, like how much inequality and, and how much poverty there was in a lot of developing countries. Thankfully, that trend is like, it's dramatically improving in terms of poverty. But it struck me as a young kid. And now fast forward to Kenya, and I saw that remittances were an enormously huge, impactful, and sustainable part of pulling people out of poverty, giving people opportunities. And I saw that in Kenya, there was also a product called M-Pesa, which is like a domestic mobile wallet. It was It's transformed financial services in Kenya. And I was like, well, why couldn't we use mobile phones to actually you know, transform the international payments landscape, the Western unions and money grams of the world, which is not at the end of the day a rocket science idea, but the timing for that was right. And, and even over the last – since I started the business in 2011, smartphone adoption globally has continued to grow and people are just trusting smartphones for financial services. And mm-hmm. as that's happening – Oh, I do my – I do like – Big, huge transactions on my phone. And yeah. it's sometimes yep. scary, but I'm like, well, I guess this is what we're doing these days. Exactly, exactly. And so it's, it was the right time to start the business. And, and thankfully, um, I think we've we've helped a lot of people.
Dan Shapiro, our guest today on the What Fuels You podcast, is a four-time founder CEO, author, investor, husband, and father. He's sold two software companies, created the best-selling board game in Kickstarter's history, Robot Turtles, and now is focusing his efforts on building Glowforge. But hold on, back up. So Robot Turtles eventually birthed the idea for, for Glowforge? So here's what went down. I sold my previous company, company number two, okay. SparkBuy, to okay. Google. Yes. And after two years, I took a leave of absence because I had promised a book to O'Reilly. So I, I uh, was working on the book, but I also was messing around with my kids and came up with this idea for this board game where the idea was that the kids were the programmers. And what do programmers do? They boss around computers. And what do kids love to do more than anything else at age four? Boss around their parents. So in the board game, the parents are the computer, and the kids boss you around by laying down cards that make you do things. And so I had this kind of harebrained idea. And then, like, weird stuff. A friend had asked me to help him pitch a TV show that had some elements of Kickstarter and be sort of the startup consultant. So I was helping him do that. And I thought, oh, man, I sh I've done angel funding. I've done, you know, bootstrapping. I've raised a bunch of venture money, but I've never crowdfunded. That's kind of new. And 2014 was the, that was the like a, that was the thing, yeah. So I was like, I'm going to try crowdfunding this crazy little game, and if enough people are interested, then I can do a production run. Um, I can do a production run of a thousand units. So I put it together, and it blew up. Wow. About twenty thousand backers. What I love is that you've got these ideas, and then you just go do them. A lot of people have ideas, and then they just kind of tuck them away. Most of them are terrible and where, fail. Where do you well? That's okay. <laughs> have you had failures? Oh Lord, so many failures. Uh, and uh, oh, and just to complete the thought, yeah. it was prototyping for Robot Turtles that I wound oh, up yeah, with yeah, this yeah. eleven thousand dollar industrial carbon dioxide cutting laser imported directly from a factory in China and installed in my garage, which was totally insane, but also delightful. And after weeks of fighting with it to get it to do anything, said, "Oh my gosh." This is, at its core, this technology is the dream. I can actually sketch something out. My kids can set, sketch something out. My friends can sketch something out or take a design or something and hit print and something beautiful comes out. Everybody should have access to this. And I think it's a thing that's missing from the world, a way that, that people can be exposed to computers in a way that isn't transactional and like you have to learn to program to be successful, but a way that says, I don't care if you want to be a ballerina or a restaurateur or anything else, computers should work for you. You should look at computers as a tool to serve you throughout your life, not as a thing you have to learn or something that's intimidating and othering. The whole point of the game is to take computers for granted, not to make them this big, scary thing that you have to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and to think of a computer as this like, oh, you boss it around. It's dumb and you're the smart one. That's how I want people to think about computers and resources. And then Glowforge was all about going, oh my gosh, like one of the things in this modern era, the ability to create something that didn't exist before is one of the most powerful things that you can bring to the world to help um, to help accomplish your goals. And getting an engineering degree gave me this tremendous unfair advantage in that. There is uh, in this world the ability to go create things is unevenly distributed and unfairly distributed. And the notion that I might be able to create the tool that lets people create who couldn't create before or lets people take something that they could only do by hand, one off, two off, and turn it into thousands to make mm -hmm. it their business, to make it their job, to make it their um, – to elevate that into something that is more than just a pastime if they want to. Yeah. Or to say, gosh, I always want to have a wood shop and I always want to play around with leather craft and I always want to do paper cutting. But those are all different tools and different skills. With one tool, I can do all of them. And that's just incredible. Roby Ganguly is today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast. Roby is the CEO and co-founder of Aptentive. Founded in 2011, Aptentive helps enterprise brands measure shifts in sentiment from customer experience to win back customers and activate fans. Aptentive helps those companies capture actionable data and proactively gather feedback from the 90% of consumer voices typically missed. If you had a crystal ball... And you could learn something about the world. I know that you're a very globally minded and intentional thinker. What would you want to know about the world? And what would you want to know about your life? I think that um, 
unfortunately right now I am I'm concerned with sort of the state of democracy. Yeah. I am concerned with the way in which um, we have uh, here in this country allowed you know, a bunch of people, I think, to take um, take power and close down voice and close down choice. And so looking forward, I, I hope that we solve this and I hope we figure out the way around it. I think, you know, the first action is for everybody to vote and use their voice because I think I think most most of us want the right things for the world and do not uh, think that our uh, misfortunes are the cause of other people coming here for opportunity. Um, so I would look forward towards that. What would I like to see for myself? I'm pretty excited about the the journey that I'm on with you know the company and with the people who matter to me. And I would like to see how my legacy. Uh, I do think about long term impact on people, and I think that uh, I'm fortunate to be in a place where I could help. Uh, customer relationships get better and I can help companies get better at dealing with customers. And I would like mm -hmm. to see if we play this out and actually have a global impact. I really do think that giving people a voice is a, it's a calling. It's something that I've felt a long, long time in my life. And in the last decade have, have felt a way to actually take action. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me being able to, to use your voice, to speak out and make change, to share information to increase the lines of communication is something that's important and it's driven me and it feels right and it feels just and it feels like a meaningful value. Sue Sue is today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast. Sue is the first chief people officer at the media company Time, where she's focused on culture building, recruitment, and human resources, also security, facilities, and other operational areas. At the end of my podcast, I always ask um, people, what fuels you? And I think I know your answer, but I'm going to let you <laughs> articulate it so beautifully as you do. I don't know about that. I mean, I was um, gratitude and humanity. And, you know, we talk about connecting with people. I mean, people take a chance on me every day, you know, and I think never taking that for granted just to say, you know what, it's a choice we have every day to say hello to somebody and to think like what's beating in that heart and where they're going and no assumptions, no boxes is what I like to say. So it's really gratitude, open mind, open heart, and some optimism along the way. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. If you'd like to check out past episodes to hear from more business leaders, go to fueltalent.com backslash podcast. And if you have a minute, please leave a review and rating on your favorite podcast app or share this episode with a friend or colleague. Please share any feedback or interview suggestions for other guests by sending a message to podcast at fueltalent.com. I'm Shauna Swirland, and thanks again for listening. Thank you.